What is happening, everybody, and welcome. This is episode number 73 of RizzoCast. I'm Stephen Rizzotto, along with Jasper and Lindsay. And today we are joined by a very special guest. He is a formerly a producer for KMBR 95.7 The Game, currently the host of the San Francisco Giants fan show on the Fan Media Network and a host producer for Mojo Breaks Media. We are pleased to have Cody Pass be on the show. Cody, what's going on? Thanks for joining us. Welcome. Hey, thanks for having me, guys. Steven, Jasper, good to, have, to talk some ball with you, uh, some Giants oh, baseball, yeah. and uh, can uh, break out the training cards so we can maybe make some trades here uh, on the fly during the show. Let's see. We'll see. There no we problems. go. Yeah, for, for sure. Uh, yeah, let's start. Let's start right away here with uh, the San Francisco Giants, who at the time of this recording just stole another game. And I was telling Jasper this. They're criminals at this point. I mean, the games that they're winning, the way they're winning them, it's criminal. And, uh, you know, becoming the first team in baseball to 70 wins, I don't think anybody was expecting this. If they said they were expecting this, they're clearly lying. Yeah. Um, so what was kind of your prediction before the season started based on the, this team on paper in spring training? I thought this was a third place team, uh, honestly. And I think that that was maybe in the more optimistic range, but just kind of seeing what this team had done since Farhan Zaidi and his regime took over where they were making sort of incremental, uh, you know, uh, changes and, and, and positive changes, I should, I should say uh, over the years. And really, I think 2019 kind of set the precedent of like, what should we expect from this team where they were competitive for half of that season? Uh, and we heard Farhan Zaidi say when he started, like, we're always going to try to be like, we're never in a full sell mode. We're never in a full buy mode, very much in line with what he did in the A's model. And then uh, even in the Dodgers mode as well, a little easier to be buyers all the time with the Dodgers. But I, I think that was kind of prepared us for what to expect here in the Zaidi regime. And uh, it, it felt like they were making all these little moves that were interesting. You know, uh, Darren Ruff, I always was a big fan of that move when they made that move. Uh, guys like Lamont Wade Jr. So I thought they would be competitive at the very least and thought maybe a year or two down the road when they can open up the checkbook, especially this offseason with so many guys coming off uh, of the payroll and so many guys available, huge star impact players. I thought... They're going to be competitive, make some interesting trades. They'll open up the checkbook and get like a star shortstop this offseason. Uh, I'm blown away with, with what they've done. I think the thing I didn't take into account was the change in philosophy with the coaching staff and believing in Gabe Kapler and what they're doing there and just completely changing the mindset, changing the batting approach, changing uh, everything. Uh, the way that they're recruiting guys, where they're bringing guys in, there was that great write-up, I think, in uh, ESPN back in either the end of May or beginning of June, where they were talking about bringing in guys like Gosman and Di Sclafani and uh, just saying, like, look, you do this well. We're going to tell you to keep doing that. Uh, and it's worked to perfection. So I think the, the players are responding. And when guys like Crawford and Posey are buying in and Belt and those guys, uh, it's easy for everyone to get along with it. And uh, I, I've just been thoroughly impressed with not just the GM and the, and the front office, but the coaching staff, I think, uh, deserves a huge round of applause for what they have done. Uh, with these veterans, getting them to buy in and giving these other guys opportunities that, uh, you know, these sort of cast off players that uh, we've come used to. Even 10 years ago, the Giants sort of uh, love to have that identity as like the misfits, the cast offs. And uh, we're seeing it again. And it's a great success. It's been wonderful to watch. Yeah. And you mentioned kind of the misfits model, but what are you seeing that's really clicked for this team on the field, not just compared to those teams of the past, but current teams in baseball right now? You know what? I, I think the big thing is that there is this perfect melding of the sort of analytic approach to baseball and the human element right now uh, going back to how they're recruiting guys basically just being like we believe in you and basically the numbers are showing why we should believe in you uh, you know with Gosman it was basically like just stick with these two pitches uh, those are your best pitches uh, we know you can be good when you do that so uh, I, I think that there has been this struggle uh, in baseball really now the last 20 years of like saber metrics and and the numbers and the and the stat nerds versus you know the old school way of thinking of the human element of the game and i think that the giants regime here with kapler and zaidi have found that perfect 
balance right now where they are so involved in like, you know, Hey, we believe in you and, and really lifting their guys up and saying, keep doing what you're doing. Uh, we saw it last year. It kind of worked to, uh, it, I, I think we saw it, uh, the worst of that last year with Trevor Gott. Remember when uh, Kapler just came saying, we're going with God, we're going with God. We believe in Trevor Gott. And it kind of just drove him into the ground. But now on the flip side, we're seeing this year where he's, you know, Tyler Rogers had a bad outing against the Dodgers. And I think there were a lot of fans that me, especially where he went out there and I thought, man, you know, maybe you should give him a break. We saw what happened with Trevor Gott, but it worked. And I think that, you know, it's stealing that confidence in the players. Uh, it's both, a great thing as a manager to do that, to, to lift your guys up and, and know that your coaches and your managers have your back. But at the same time, it's also driven by the stats. It's also just driven by what the computers are telling them, and what the, uh, what the averages are telling them. So I think the giants have found that perfect balance. And it's something that I think a lot of organizations have been trying to find for years and years. And uh, I think this team has struck an incredible balance. Yeah. A hundred percent. I always think about the first game in 2020 against the Dodgers where Kevin Gosman came out of the bullpen in one of the games for the series. And, you know, after the game, he was like, what is going on? I mean, this is not what I was signed here to be. And, you know, I thought those days were, you know, previously coming out of the Reds bullpen, coming out of the Braves bullpen. I thought that was over. I thought I was finally getting a chance to start and uh, ended up becoming one of the, uh, the better pitchers in the national league since then. And Gabe Kapler's kind of, even this year he's let starters go deeper in the games and I guess that leads me into this I mean he was criticized when he was hired to manage the Giants I know a lot of fans wanted Joe Espada to come in here and and you know culture shock culture change they were a little bit disappointed when Gabe Kapler was hired on there's you know some other reasons why uh do you think you know kind of the perception of him as a him as a manager has changed and is, is would you consider him now a good manager i know it's such a tough role to uh, i mean manager of the year the baseball writers association of america the writers that have to vote for that award like how can you vote for manager of the year right because like how can you evaluate like there could be a great manager with a horrible team and there could be a really bad manager with a good team so it's impossible to uh sorry that was my side tangent there but uh do you think Gabe Kapler's a good manager we'll, we'll we'll stick with that yes I do I do uh and I think that last year was almost like a trial run I hate to say that they weren't taking the season seriously I think they were but I think they also saw 60 games this is kind of this is not real baseball right now this is different where uh, this is a merit this is a sprint and so it was kind of like let's throw stuff against the wall see what works like the Gosman stuff and some bullpen pitchers um so I think that was kind of him experimenting whereas this is the real Gabe Kapler we're seeing but I think that it, he should be the manager of the year like no question it's not even close uh, it's also funny that and I think we I, I mentioned this on, a, on one of our episodes uh, of the fan show Bruce Bochy zero manager of the year awards uh, with the Giants and Kapler's gonna win it in his first full season which is uh, <laughs> yeah the old school fans maybe still if there's any fans out there who are still anti Kapler that's really gonna stick in their craw right they're there. fighting air right now <laughs> yeah exactly exactly but uh, he is a good manager but I think that this speaks to modern baseball that more and more we're seeing that managers and GMs are paired together, uh, that that relationship is what is driving baseball. That I think the manager is there to kind of, he's not so much like the, like Zaidi's not pulling the strings and telling them what to do, but they have a philosophy that they're coming up with together. And I think more and more modern managers are there to one, execute that philosophy and to be a, a guy in the clubhouse who's a calming influence, to be a player's manager, which we're seeing all the time. It's kind of just a guy to rally the troops, uh, get their, have their guys' backs, all that stuff. And uh, a Kapler, a guy who's been in tons of clubhouses through his career, tons of success through his career, uh, you know, hearing from guys that worked in and around him. Uh, I know I used to work with Kevin Franson back at Cambiar, and I remember him really coming out and be like, uh, he, this guys like him 
the players like him in, in Philadelphia. That was not a decision made because the players didn't like him. The players liked Gabe Kapler. That was a decision made just because I, I think the Philly fan base, you know, they were just going to keep eating him alive if, if he stayed there any longer. And I think that the philosophy with the GM just didn't click. Uh, they're kind of a more, not necessarily old school, but I guess as old school as you can get now with the, the Girardi, uh, you know, Girardi running the show over there. So I think that's really what it comes down to is that he is a good manager. Yes. But it really highlights how important, uh, especially for, I think, some of the more successful organizations now, that relationship to have that, uh, to have the GM and the front office be totally in line with what the manager is doing uh, is the way things are going uh, for modern baseball. Yeah, and you talk about modern baseball, and Gabe Kapler's obviously, he was brought in, everyone was like, this is an analytics guy, they're going to do this, but what have you really seen change in his approach as a manager from his stint in Philadelphia and now with the Giants? I think he's just more confident now, is, is really the main thing. I think he knows that, uh, you know, to, to kind of go off another local sport, uh, when Kyle Shanahan came in with the 49ers, I think he gets that long contract. He's given the confidence and the assurance that you're our guy. And you can go ahead and try some things here. And hey, if some stuff doesn't work, don't worry about it. You're still our guy for the long haul here. And I think that's the main thing with Kapler. There's just that feeling of like, try things out. If it's not working, go with something else. But you're still going to be our guy. And I, I really think that that's the main thing. And again, just him and Zaidi see eye to eye. They have sort of the same ideas, the same philosophy. We know Zaidi really went to bat for him uh, and, and vouched for this guy. And so, yeah, I, th I think that's really the main thing. Is he's just got all the confidence now to, to do what he wants and to build his coaching staff the way that he wants. Uh, I know there were, uh, I've mentioned a few times, there were so many jokes, I think going into that first spring training where it's like, that is the most crowded dugout I've ever seen. It's like, how many hitting coaches do you need? How many pitches coaches do you need? Well, apparently the right amount. That's exactly what uh, Kapler and them have been preaching is like, we need to have some more eyes, some more bodies in there to, to get different evaluations and, and to really preach the philosophy uh, of what they're doing over there. So uh yeah, I think he's he's done a terrific job, and he's really coming to his own. Yeah, and I mean, baseball is one of those sports where, like, you see guys get given up on way too early by organizations. Yeah, I mean, you'll have one bad year, and they'll just throw them to the side. But Farhan and Kapler have had this ability to take on these guys, like Lamont Wade Jr., who was in the Minnesota system for a long time. Yaz, another guy who's in a system. Like, what is it that makes them so good at creating these environments that allow these players to succeed and flourish when they come to SF? Man, uh, I think it's, again, just that sort of belief of like, hey, we're, you're here for a reason. Like, we saw something that everybody else seemed to not see. Uh, it, it's kind of surprising more teams. Uh, I don't know if it's like, is the rest of baseball just not as smart? Because we saw society, like, when he was in L.A., uh, apparently was begging to get Max Muncy onto the team. And the Dodgers essentially just did him a favor and said, yeah, fine, sign him. Who cares? Uh, and he's become one of, if not maybe, you know, one of the best first basemen and one of the best hitters uh, in the National League now. So, uh, yeah, I think that's really all it is. And I, it goes back to that, like, balancing the analytics with the human element stuff that uh, I think this organization is doing a really good job at, of just lifting these guys up, saying, hey, we're going to try you out. You're here for a reason. You're going to get a shot um, where maybe they wouldn't in every other place. They're, they're good at finding, uh, you know, guys that fit, a very specific role like Lamont Wade Jr. was really just brought in to be like, you're just going to be a guy we're going to use against righties and we'll go from there. Uh, and look at what an incredible contributor he's turned into. Uh, it's just guys understanding their role. I think they're, I think the organization is pretty blunt in a good way about this is what we expect you to do for us. And then if you can do more than that, great. That's just icing on the cake. Uh, and uh, we've seen it, you know, not just the Giants, but other organizations looking outside, getting more creative, looking to uh, Korean baseball leagues, so the Japanese baseball leagues, the independent leagues. And, uh, you know, and the Giants have done an incredible job. Darren Ruff and Jay Jackson, uh, all these sorts of guys who have come from international leagues and reinvented themselves. Uh, and Giants are doing a great job at that too. So it's just getting creative looking everywhere and uh yeah i think they've they've really built an environment where it's uh, just kind of telling players like 
you know, we believe in you. You're here for a reason. And yeah. uh, you, you see what's happened. It's 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 been wild to see uh, everything sort of come together so beautifully. Uh, and I think the rest of the league should be very, very scared this offseason when the Giants actually have a ton of money to spend to bring in some huge players. Yeah, that, that's definitely uh, going to be interesting to watch this offseason. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, by the way, the twins are not answering the phone anymore. No, during, no team know, is. No team is. Uh, the twins just, I mean, Sean Anderson is on like his 35th organization this year, just got claimed by the San Diego Padres. So oh, geez. Uh, that trade is uh, looking pretty good for the Giants. Um, but one thing that that has been great for them has been the starting rotation. And I think in the the, the month of uh, April, we saw it firsthand. We're like, God, is this gonna is this gonna survive the whole year? There's guys that haven't thrown a ton with Alex Wood, whose workload has been, you know, kind of balanced in the bullpen sometimes. I know we we know he pitched out of the bullpen with the Dodgers in the postseason. How will he be healthy, you know, innings wise? Can he handle it? Desclafani hasn't had a lot of success. He's in a bigger ballpark, um, you know, way better ballpark for him. And I think by the time June came around, I think everybody kind of started you know, buying into this rotation. Right. But now like with postseason baseball coming up and the giants, um, you know, most likely, I guess at this point going into the postseason, they have Gosman, Disclafani, Wood, Cueto, Webb. There's going to be an odd man out here. That's not going to be starting postseason games. And I know you tweeted something the other day about, you know, Webb for you being a lock to maybe start a postseason game. Who would be the, who'd be the odd man out there in that group? I want to hear what you guys think too, because uh, right now, and if you had asked me in June, I think my top three guys would have been pretty easily Gosman, Di Sclafani, Wood. Mm-hmm. Now, I think it might be Gosman, Webb, and Cueto. Uh, Cueto has been incredibly consistent over the last few outings. Uh, I know today it wasn't, uh, it, it, he still was pretty sharp for the most part. I know he gave up three yard runs, but uh, right now I feel pretty confident with him. Uh, we'll see when Di Sclafani comes back. Uh, if maybe those recent struggles were just from the shoulder fatigue, I really hope so. Cause he's been so sharp and he's been one of their best pitchers. I mean, he's, you could argue he's had maybe two of the best starts of the year, for this staff and that's a staff with Kevin Gosman, a Cy Young contender in there right now. Uh, so uh, I, I think though the odd man out is probably Alex Wood. He's just been a different pitcher as of late. Uh, just the, the walks are up a little bit. He's getting hit a lot more. It, it, it's, it's been a little uh, disappointing to see because he was really electric those first few, couple months of the season. But yeah, I want to hear what your guys' top three right now is. And if, if you're going into a five game series, who do you stack up? If you're the Giants, Jasper, do you want to take this one <laughs> first? Yeah, I mean, I think you got to go Gosman, Cueto, definitely, just because I mean, Cueto has experience in the postseason. Yeah, He's a guy true. who he can definitely turn a switch if it comes down to a game you need to win the NLDS. Man, I think you got to go Webb though, and Webb, and then Discafani. I mean, I feel like Discafani and Wood are kind of interchangeable because Del Scafani also comes from the Reds, who love to put their pitchers in the bullpen, like they'll to like Iglesias. Uh, Mally, those are two guys who you've seen them kind of be interchangeable between rotation and bullpen. But yeah, I mean, Alex Wood and Del Scafani both have great long relief potential, I think, come the postseason. Yeah, I think I would. Oh God, I really like Webb in that role, too, though. I mean, that's the that's the yeah, I, mean, I like that's I true. like I like what Wood did in the postseason with the Dodgers. I think that plays a part into it. Uh, the Farhan Zaidi Dodgers that he kind of built and has fingerprints on. So maybe that's in the consideration. Um but man, yeah, Gosman's the lock. Cueto, I mean, I don't, I don't know if they just pull a full on Barry Zito and he's left off the postseason roster. I don't know if I don't wow. think that happens. Um, I think they might this, do that in the NLDS, honestly. Maybe just, just to clear yeah. up, maybe get an extra hitter in there. But I, I think he's probably there for the NLCS. Yeah, yeah, I could see that. God, it, it's it's really it's really tough because yeah, I, I'd say it, it would be, I would do Gosman. Di Sclafani and Webb. I yeah. think I'll, I think that that's what I would do for sure. You're probably on to something though with the Logan Webb thing. And as much as I would, I, I, I think just based on talent, he is the second best pitcher on this team right mm-hmm. now, but he's younger. And I think there is going to be an inning, innings limit uh, for him. 
that maybe he is just a guy you bring out for an inning or two. And he had the uh, shoulder as your secret thing. weapon. Yeah, exactly. There's there's the injuries. There's the youth. You don't want to tire him out too much. Uh, this is probably going to be, yeah, this is going to be the most innings he's ever pitched in the major mm-hmm. leagues this season. So that's probably a concern as well. But you know what? It could you could do a hell of a lot worse as for us, you know, one or two inning guy to come out of the bullpen, the Logan Webb right now. It's just great to see the Giants actually develop a pitcher for the first time since what? Madison Bumgarner? Is that the last time that the Giants that's for me? I can't think of one. anybody else. Maybe he, mm-hmm. you know, that's that's about it. Heston didn't last very long, but you'd probably give him credit for Zach Wheeler, a little credit for Zach. That's Wheeler. true. <laughs> that's true. Give him, yeah. Oh man. If it, you, that's 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 another one where he pitched a complete game today. He was incredible. <laughs> mm-hmm. Uh if you had told me 10 years ago, who do you want? Zach Wheeler or Madison Bumgarner in 2021? Uh, I would have said bump mad, mad bum by yeah. a long shot, but it's not even close now. And it's I weird. always think of uh you know, Carlos Beltran giving Bruce Bochy the uh, the Rolex <laughs> watch <laughs> for the jersey number 15. I mean, yep. uh, like, just go back in time. It's 10 years now since that trade. A, a trade that I still will say I would still make because mm-hmm. of the scenario they were in. I think when Beltran came, the, he comes to Philadelphia too. It's an NLCS rematch his first game. They win. I think they go up four games in first place at that point near the end of July. It just had this feeling of like they're gonna they're gonna make the playoffs without Posey, and uh, obviously it didn't work out. But uh, I do remember those rumors. It was either it's come down to Zach Wheeler or Gary Brown. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, if Gary, only we could take a time machine back. Yeah, Gary Brown, who uh, did not answer an email if he wanted to come on the podcast. Anyhow, we don't <laughs> have to we don't have to put him on blast here. Uh, let's talk about the, the newest prize position for the Giants, Chris Bryant, and this was a big name that they got, the biggest name in the Zaidi era. Uh, and this is perfect for their brand of baseball plays everywhere, plays left field, center field, third base, first base, you know, there's talk of him even moving Evan Longoria to second base. I don't know who brought that up. Was it Willard? I can't remember. Somebody brought that up, but I don't know if it's going to happen, but how important is this addition and, and what is kind of the outlook for him this season in the orange and black? Where do you see him fitting best? I think this is the biggest midseason trade they've made. Since the Hunter Pence deal, and I know they also made the Marco Scudero deal, which in the short term had a bigger effect, but Grant, you know, I dig Blockbuster. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That was the real blockbuster. But this is that feeling of like they brought in a superstar who's going to change the dynamic of the clubhouse for the for the best. And, you know, if, if Farhan Zaidi could concoct a player in a laboratory, all the things he wants in a player, it would be Chris Bryant an MVP caliber guy uh, with a great personality face of the franchise. Oh yeah. And he can play probably seven positions. And you know what, if you ask him, can you be the emergency catcher? I guarantee you he's got a catcher's bit somewhere <laughs> in the back. It is uh, in his bag. Uh, he's, he's been such a huge addition. And I think that he also, uh, I don't want it to be like a foregone conclusion that he's here for the long haul. He's still a free agent this off season. He's going to have plenty of suitors but it just kind of has that vibe of like, he's here for a while, right? If everything goes right, the giants are going to do everything in their power to keep him in the origin black for a long time. And it's the perfect bridge. I think from the Posey Crawford belt era, the world series era, those veterans saying goodbye and retiring in the next couple of years as they play their last few seasons, potentially with the giants and ushering in that new era with Joey Barton, Elliot Ramos, and Marco Luciano, if and when they eventually come up. Uh, and, and Chris Bryant will be that face of the franchise to sort of bridge those two eras. I think that that's not just his on-the-field performance, but in terms of just keeping fans engaged, the marketing aspect of it, that's where I think Chris Bryant is also going to be huge for this franchise to, to keep everybody involved. You saw it with, you know, it's, we keep going back to sort of how the Dodgers operate, but you know, Zaidi is, was from there. And I think the way they operated always was even when we're in rebuild mode, we're competing. We're always going to have a face of the franchise, you know, all those years where Bellinger and Bueller and uh, Corey Seager all developing, they were still competitive. They were still in the free agent market, still finding guys to be faces of the franchise in those years in between. Now all those guys are here and they've got a legit shot at the World Series every single year. I think you're going to see that same sort of vibe here with the Giants as they say goodbye to Posey and Crawford, hopefully not for a couple more years. Uh, And 
you've got Chris Bryant and how there's not much of a better face for the franchise uh, than, than Chris Bryant. Yeah. So, I mean, fast forward to the off season though, you do have, it feels like half this team on expiring contracts. It's crazy. Do they really push to sign Chris Bryant? And I mean, I know they got in trouble with loyalty contracts in the past and Farhan is a completely different GM than Brian Sabian, but is the rebuild complete? Like, I I really can't tell with this team. It's hard. This is going to be the most interesting offseason for Giants baseball in years. I mean, even during the World Series runs, there was like really no doubts. Like Posey was on a long term deal with his his draft contract and they locked him up. And um, and you always had that feeling that like Sabian and and, uh, the Bobby Evans uh, front office were always to a detriment in a way, uh, always good at giving their guys big deals. I don't think you're going to see that as much. But what I think you're going to see is you know, Posey and Crawford got their big deals and maybe, maybe I'm being too nice and maybe I'm thinking too highly, but I do believe that if they say to them, Hey, look, we're giving Chris Bryan all this money. We're giving Kevin Gosman all this money. Do you want to come back for like two more years? And, you know, instead of it being a $20 million deal, do you want to come back at about eight to $10 million? Uh, Same with Crawford. And I don't think Crawford's going to get much more than, I don't yeah. think he's going to get anything more than a two-year deal, maybe a three-year deal on the open market. Two for 30? I think that's, yeah, exactly. Yeah, something like that. Uh, and I think, too, especially with his year, would you rather have Crawford for two or three more years th- over Corey Seager, Carlos Correa for six, seven years for huge amounts of money, knowing that Marco Luciano is waiting in the wings, knowing he's just absolutely tearing it up right now in the minor leagues, that to me is kind of an easy decision now with the way Crawford's playing. Um, even if you didn't go after Seager Correa, I think the Giants would have been better going after a guy who could be a stopgap for the next couple of years, be it a positive contributor, both on the field and in the batter's box. Uh, and Crawford fits the bill. It's like, it's, it's the best of both worlds. So I think you're going to see maybe the veteran guys, Posey Crawford say, yeah, I'll take a little bit of a discount, stay with this team. Cause you've got a good thing going right now. Um, and really it becomes then what do you do with the pitching staff, which is going to be the hardest choice. I think they're going to pony up and give Kevin Gosman a big deal. Uh, you saw with the Dodgers that Zaidi likes to, you know, these guys who are surprise guys, Justin Turner came out of nowhere with them and got rewarded with a huge deal. It got rewarded with big contracts. I think you're going to see the same thing with Kevin Gosman. I think you'll get rewarded with a big deal. Uh, and then from there, who knows? You got Logan Webb, which is great. Uh, but literally four fifths of your rotation are free agents. It's that is about as tough a puzzle to solve as any, but I think the guarantees right now are probably Gosman is back. And I think Posey and Crawford will be back too. And Chris Bryant will get a big deal. Yeah. And do you think Del Scafanian would have made enough of an impression to warrant maybe a little more money for them? You know, I don't think, I think that's the biggest. Yeah. I, I don't see wood coming back. I think he's going to go yeah. maybe. And uh, similar to what you saw last year with what Tyler Anderson uh, and um, it's, it's escaping me. The, the other pitcher that was on there last year, this, this is such a revolving door now with the Giants starting rotation last couple Smiley. of years. Smiley. Uh, there you go. Drew yeah, Smiley. You Thank go. you. Drew yeah. Smiley. <laughs> Smiley got rewarded with a nice contract as well. I think you'll see that with wood. I, D. Scalfani of the two, I could see him coming back. But there's also a ton of really good veteran pitchers that are available the next offseason. I know Max Scherzer is currently in Dodger blue, but that has always struck me as something that's going to eventually happen. I could see uh, Max Scherzer with the Giants next year on a one or a two year deal, taking a discount to come onto the team um, and get another try to get another title. Uh, and the Dodgers are going to have a lot of decisions to make this offseason, too. Uh, Clayton Kershaw is a free agent. Corey Seager is a free agent, obviously. Cody Bellinger is now a big question mark. He's not a free agent, but I think there was a lot of talks about a big extension for him. And does that even happen now with the way he's been performing over the last year or so? Uh, I don't think it does. I think they're probably going to invest in Seager. Uh, so they're going to have to make a decision, I think, between Kershaw and Scherzer. And they're going to choose Kershaw. I, I just would be shocked if they chose Scherzer over that. Uh, so I think Scherzer is definitely a guy that to keep an eye on uh, to fill out that rotation. So you could be looking at Gosman. If I was GM, Gosman, Scherzer, yeah. uh, Logan Webb, probably Di Scalfani, and you figure out a guy for the fifth spot. Mm. Yeah. Jasper. 
Oh, that's me again. Uh, yeah, but <laughs> anyways, I mean, we're talking about. <laughs> So say yeah what do you guys think like, do you guys do you guys think yeah. uh I, i'm trying to think who are the other big free agent starters for next season yeah i even sure really looked at really it i mean ones. we all hear about the shortstops right yeah. and i was yeah. i was i wrote down a note here i was going to mention um you know i think i think it all depends on how much they you know what they view of marco luciano i mean if they view him as a third baseman i think he would already made the move right but then again you look at the free agents that are shortstops and you look at Seeger, I think Seeger's a third baseman. I mean, I'm sorry. I think yeah. I've kind of always thought of him like that. And, you know, who knows? Correa is a big guy for the position. I don't know if he's going to make the move at some point. Um, probably not before Seeger does. Right. So I think, you know, it depends on that. Um, but yeah, I think Crawford being a two year gap bridge, uh, bridge to Luciana would be a perfect idea. So yeah, that, I, I think Seeger's definitely going to dictate the shortstop market for sure. Yeah, and I don't see anybody wanting to take. I, Carlos Correa is a great player, but that's a lot of baggage to take on, man. <laughs> yeah, I'm serious. Yeah. Like, it's do you want like it, it? It's not just that like it's the Astros scandal and all that, but like of all the players on that team, and may, it, you guys you correct me worst. if I'm wrong. The he's worst. the guy who like all the other guys are kind of like, yeah, I don't, I don't want to talk about it. You know, I don't want to talk about it. And he's just like, yeah. What's up? We did it. So screw you. You know, deal with it, man. We got a ring and you don't. It's like, damn, man. Like, uh, I, yeah, I don't know if I want that vibe in the show. When, when he talked down to Ken Rosenthal, do you remember that? Yeah. When he's like, well, I mean, everybody talks down to Ken Rosenthal. No pun. <laughs> That's mean. <laughs> no, I, I can't do I, I can't do Ken like that. That's mean. Uh, but yeah, that's that's a good point for sure. But I do think that I mean, the Dodgers, I don't think they would care to be honest, because Trey Turner's their insurance policy. Oh, yeah, but fans would be real upset if Correa ends up, uh, if, you, if you're talking about Carlos Correa going to the Dodgers, which I, uh, I'm oh, not sure if that's what you're insinuating. Be, no, but, I was saying that if, if Seager walks, then oh, I, I gotcha, mean, I gotcha. Trey Turner's there, and I don't I don't think the Dodgers yeah. really have a connection to Seager. He's always hurt. I mean, yeah, I didn't, you know, I didn't even think about that. Yeah. You're right. That's totally what they, that's the move that they were making is mm-hmm. they're, they're ready for life without Corey Seager right yeah. now with that Trey Turner move for sure. And Bellinger's yeah, I mean, a platoon guy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I crazy. think with Turner too, I think he's only scratching the surface of his potential. I mean, this is a guy who everyone's been like, I think the past few years we've heard he's a 30, 30 guy. He's a 30, 30 guy. And I don't think he was ever going to achieve that in Washington, but with the Dodgers and what they have in place, man, I think the sky's the limit for Trey Turner in LA. So I he's do think Corey crazy is probably going to walk. Yeah, yeah. He, he turned is so underrated. Like uh, he gets kind of lost the last few years because he's playing with Juan Soto and, you know, and uh, they got Scherzer and Strasburg doing their thing when they were winning the World Series. But super underrated guy. It's just the rich getting richer for the Dodgers. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, but I mean, you talk about how big this offseason is for probably all three teams in the NL West. Do you think we're going to see a three team race going forward for the next decade? And if Man. so, how crazy is that going to be? It's a hundred percent going to be a three team race because you can never count out the Dodgers. Even, even if the Dodgers farm system is not going to be, it needs to be replenished. They're going to be fine. They got enough money. Uh, they're the Yankees of the West. The Padres have Fernando Tatis Jr. For the foreseeable future. Plus Manny Machado is still performing pretty good. Like I feel like we forget just how good Manny Machado is and he's doing just fine. That pitching staff, which was supposed to be so much better this year. I know it's been a big disappointment, but getting Clevenger back next year, I think, is a really sneaky move that I think we're forgetting about. And you got him. Darvish has been pretty great for the most part. I know Blake Snell's been a disappointment. Um, I'm still waiting for the Chris Paddock breakout season. Me too. Don't know if it's coming, but I'm still waiting for it. Uh, and we've seen that the Padres and A.J. Preller are not afraid to spend and they're they yep. maybe there's a little bit of an inferiority complex with the Giants and the Dodgers kind of owning the division, but they're not going anywhere. As long as you got Fernando Tatis, you have to make sure like they've invested 13 years into him. They have to make sure that they get at least one World Series appearance or win out of those 13 years and they are going to fight like hell to do it. And the Giants are building an incredible thing as we've been talking about. They've got I think you've been seeing, uh, no pun intended, they are the sleeping giant right now in all of baseball. The moment they can start spending money, uh, I mean, they've been finding like 
Lamont Wade Juniors and Darren Ruffs uh, out of you know the the bargain bin pile. They don't have to go shopping at the bargain bin. They don't got to go shopping at the dollar store anymore. They can go to Saks Fifth Avenue now and get whoever <laughs> they get whatever they want very very soon. Yeah, hundred percent. I'd say that the the thing that I'm most happy about this season watching is San Diego getting a great baseball team. I mean, I know Giants fans don't yeah. want to hear that, but I think. I've always thought of San Diego as a baseball town, not like a big, big baseball town, like maybe Chicago or New York or San Francisco, but like it's always been there. Even, even before the Padres even got a team, they were a minor league team for a long time. They were in the PCL league and just to see them pack that place out. And I mean, full, I mean, Fernando Tatis, I mean, and I've never, I've never bought the argument that, Oh, you know, they're just bandwagon fans. Everybody has to hop on at some point. Right. So I'm really happy that that organization's getting themselves uh, a really nice team and they're, they're packing out that ballpark. Great place to play baseball. Great place to live. That goes beautiful, man. Beautiful. I mean... Absolutely. So, I mean, that, that makes me happy to see them see them doing well um but yeah i mean i've got the this is the closest i can yeah. come I've, if you're watching i'm wearing the pale ale 394 from uh what is it from ale smith down there because obviously great beer down in uh, san diego i would say oh, yeah. if I, I i almost can't admit it but like when the padres came out their their new uni, new uniforms i'm like oh they're yeah, so are, nice those are good they're man so nice i really like yes. those and fernando tatis is really fun to watch like i was like no 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 i'm a giants fan i can't do that can't watch. Mm-hmm. Cannot enjoy Padre baseball, but uh, there's a little part of me that enjoys watching them and uh, w- watching them succeed. And I love Petco Park so much. I love San Diego, man. I got a soft spot yeah. for San Diego, but uh, no, I can't root for the Padres. Are you kidding me? No, I yeah, no, can't do it. Yeah, their yeah. farm system's also insane. I mean, they have so many great players down there that are just stuck because they have amazing players up there like Mackenzie Gore, CJ Abrams. Yeah. Yeah, the Abrams situation is going to be interesting in a couple of years. I mean, he can't play shortstop, so they're going to have to figure out somewhere to put him. Uh, yeah. Either they move Machado to first in a couple of years or something, or I don't know what they're going to do. It's going to be it's yeah. a tough decision. I think the the priority for them has to be getting Eric Cosmer off their roster. I mean, that, yep. that yeah. needs to be done, I think. <laughs> um, anyhow, back to the Bay Area. I mean, you're a Bay Area guy, you know, kind of what were some of your favorite all-time baseball or, or Giants moments growing up? it's a good one. A, yeah. uh, the first year I was like really, really into the Giants was uh, I got into the Giants with the 2001 home run chase, the Barry Bonds home run chase. I think a lot of kids my age, a lot of guys my age were in the same boat. Uh, now you're on episode was, number 73. There you go. Exactly. <laughs> and yeah, for years, like I would always, I think my, my, my very first email was Giants fan 73. So uh, yeah, you know where I was at. Uh, but that's where I really fell in love with the Giants. But then 2002 was the first season where I was watching every single game. So like, I'm so, so deeply connected to that team. I love that team to death. So like, Winning the NL pennant in 02 is still one of my fondest baseball memories. I know it didn't end well, but uh, watching that with my family was like one of my very f- fondest memories. Um, some of my favorite memories are just going to games where, you know, because there were some rough years there. Uh, going with my mom to, there was a game where Ray Durham had a walk off home run against the Oakland A's, and it was like a six run comeback in like seventh inning on. They, the Giants were down like six nothing. They came back. I, I can't exactly recall, but. Uh, Ray Durham had a walk-off home run. That was awesome. Going to watch Randy Johnson get his like 297th win in the rain uh, with one of my best friends, just hanging out with our uh, Dollar Tree umbrellas that we had bought just because we realized it was going to start raining. Uh, So that was fun. Obviously the World Series, but it's been like we have been very, very spoiled over the last 20 years or so uh, with all the history and all the world series. Um, I've been very lucky to go to all the parades. I got to be in the 2014 parade being with KMBR, which is like something I will cherish for the rest of my life. Uh, I feel very, very lucky that I, that my time in sports radio coincided directly with the championship run getting to be out there every weekend with Marty Laurie during the 2012 season and then 2014 being, you know, on the board and behind the scenes at KMBR and, you know, having my name attached to those games, being a very, very, very small part of the run uh, is something I'll always cherish. Yeah. I mean, the Giants fan base is one of the best in baseball. What is it about this fan base that makes it so unique compared to the other ones around the league? 
Uh, I think there is this, uh, you know, the kind of steal a line from, uh, for talking my sports radio, the steal line from Gary Radnich is uh, that we have a little bit of. Uh, nobody cares. Yeah, there you go. No, nobody cares. Yeah, <laughs> no, no, not that. We have perspective. <laughs> we have perspective. We can have a good time and enjoy this stuff. But I think that it's not the end of the world when this team loses, but we enjoy, like we enjoy the best things about it. As I guess what I'm trying to say is that we're not as overly negative fan base. Um, even in the face of, of, of times where we totally could be, I, I point to Barry Zito as the number one time where giants fan had every right to be negative and to boo and to do whatever. Uh, and they didn't. And we were positive. We hung through hung with Barry Zito, pretty much through thick and thin. There might've been some bumps in the road um, and it all just paid off be- so beautifully in 2012 where oh. it, it was just incredible to watch. Like it was, it, I, there were so many great storylines, but I feel like 2012 to me will always be the Barry Zito postseason. He became a hero. The contract finally felt worth it. So I think there's that. I think there's just positivity with this team. You go to the ballpark, you have a good time. Um and uh, you don't get caught up with the negative stuff, which uh, I, I think uh, is a uniquely West Coast baseball thing and even more uniquely a Bay Area baseball thing. Yeah, and 100 percent. Just look up Los Angeles Dodger fans on Twitter right now and go to videos. They've been on. There's been fight videos on yeah. my timeline every night for the past week. So, I mean, just, yeah. I mean, I mean, I've, I've seen some fights in the, the bleachers here and there. It's some yeah, giants. A's it happens. It's a little chippy, but not on a consistent basis. Like you see sometimes mm-hmm. in LA. So, you know, it happens. I like Dodger stadium. I'll admit actually right now, I actually like going out there, but uh, yeah, it's, it's gotten a little chippy last couple of weeks. All right. So giants fans go ahead and cancel Cody for that one. No, just kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, back to, back to your kind of work in the media. We know that, you know, we know everybody knows the the on air talent at stations like ninety five seven and KMBR, but we don't know the behind the scenes personnel as well. And I, I I've had FP Santangelo Jr. on here, and he's talked about that uh, a little bit. So, what was kind of your role and duties, kind of as a as a producer? Take us inside the the behind the scenes. So I was like, I always like to, to call myself the Swiss army knife uh, over at KMBR. Uh, I was just the guy who like, anytime there was some opportunity, I'm like, yeah, I'll do that. Whatever. I don't care what it was. Uh, I mean, I literally, let's see. I was network coordinator for Giants, uh, Warriors, San, San Jose Sabercats. Uh, I think it did some Stanford as well. Uh, did the pregame and postgame over with Levi's Stadium when that opened. I'm in the South Bay, so I just thought, well, I literally live here. I can just I'll, – I'll go help out, whatever you guys need. Um, on-site engineering at the ball games, and uh, like I said, working with Marty Lurie. So a little bit of everything. Uh, produced Sports Fund 680, and then eventually came to tonight. Worked with Ray Woodson and uh, Kevin France and all those guys. Um, and you know what? There were – uh, there were times where there were some frustrations like yeah, there is with every job, but like at the end of the day, I always had to like look at myself and be like, I'm working in sports, man. Uh, as, as Ray Woodson would say to kind of keep everything in perspective, we get to work at the candy store. Like that's what our job is. Uh, we get to do the fun stuff. Like we don't have to worry about the stresses of everyday real life. Like we get to talk baseball and basketball. And, uh, and during that era where it was like the giants were winning world series. And like, I got to be, work in the game like again i'm the, i was the network coordinator for the warriors first championship in 50 years like that was cool man and uh so i think yeah looking back at it all it was just it was cool to do all those different things and work with so many great guys uh you know shout out to guys like uh, mike holler and uh, brian smith tim webb uh, uh you know adam copeland bot hill all these you know all these joe shasky all these great guys i've worked with through the years uh ryan covey uh so it's, it, it, I got these guys who I'm friends with for life and uh, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun doing it. Yeah. Joe, real quick, Joe Shasky, also friend of the podcast has been on before and nice. uh, alumni of uh, my high school, Archbishop Rudin high school. There you in go. San Francisco. So nice. Love Shasky. Yeah. He's yeah. Uh, as passionate as they come. I worked with uh, Shasky and uh, Covey last year uh, on their show and uh, yeah, had a blast doing it. Yeah, I mean, so you've gone from kind of now creating the content to making your own. What's kind of your end goal here? Like, what do you want to achieve in the sports, uh, I guess, media world? I mean, I think for me, it's, I, I you know what, this is, uh, I don't want to sound like, like I'm now old man Cody giving advice <laughs> to the young kids, but uh, 
uh, there was like some to get real for a second like uh there was some frustrations i think i i, I jumped out of cambr and tried to work um in a uh, like for a podcast uh like a major tech podcast and you know what and it's not their fault like they, they have a great operation but it just within a week i was like this is not me man and i i did it as sort of a uh you know kind of chasing the money in a way and uh very quickly realized it's not for me. Um, tried to get back into radio. And uh, I think there, the thing I learned was like, I think when I was younger and I always tried to say yes, but then there were like some opportunities where I thought, oh, is that like, is that a step down from what I'm doing? And I think now that I have a little more clarity and I've had years of doing this, I think it's at a certain point, you, you got to say yes to a lot of stuff until you make it, you know, once you make it, then you can kind of dictate your own terms. So I think that's the main thing that uh, I've learned. And that's sort of the end game is kind of just doing things and building up a resume. Um, you know, I've, I've always wanted to do, uh, especially now doing the work I'm doing at Mojo Break, where I'm given a lot more freedom to do uh, online content, podcasting and stuff. I've always kind of felt like that's the future of this stuff. Uh, you know, what you guys are doing here. Uh, that I think that's really the future of where we're heading uh, is people like to hear different voices and it's in a different uh, formats when they want to hear it. Uh, so that's, I think that's where it really it, it comes down to for me is like trying to build something, uh, build a bigger brand um, online doing that. But uh, Hey, I'm, you know, always going to be looking for opportunities, always hustling to, to do that sort of stuff, whether it be doing this or, you know, radio or whatever it may be. Um, hell, I still like to be calling play by play for baseball games as well. That's where it all started. So uh, yeah. if that, if that opportunity can eventually happen to down the road, I, I jump at the chance to do it. So that's great. Real quick, before we get into all of our, you know, trading stuff and, yeah. and showing off our cards, is it true? Cause I had Steve Berman, otherwise known as the Bay area sports guy on, and yep. I forgot to ask him this. Is it true that like if you work for 95.7 The Game or KMBR, you cannot even allude to anything? They call it the other station. You can't say the station's name. Is that right? Nope. Can't say it. That makes it's sense. The, yeah. They are like uh, they who shall be not be named. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like you can't utter Voldemort's name or, you know, in, in, uh, in KMBR and you can't do the vice versa. 95.7. Yeah. It's the other. It's the other station. Mm -hmm. um, so and yet. There's so much cross, like people just come from other stations. Like, you know, when I went to, K to 95.7, it's like, you know, I'm talking with Matt Kolsky again and, and Bate and, <laughs> and, and Ryan. And yeah, I'm like, I know all these guys. Like, it's it's funny that we do that. And yet, like, we're all in the same family. You know, we're all in the sports yeah. radio family. Um, when we're at games, everyone's talking to each other. So uh, definitely a friendly rivalry. I'm glad I got to experience both sides of it. Very different. Uh, on both sides i'm not going to say one's better than the other but i'm glad that uh, i experienced both ways of doing it can be our sort of you know the tried and true old school um and i think they've done a really good job last few years of uh bringing in some new voices and same goes for 957 which i think they've always done a great job of giving uh, a lot of people a chance that maybe wouldn't in a traditional radio when i was starting so um it, it's it shows that there's a lot of interest and a lot of healthy interest for sports here in this area man it's everyone who gets this knock that like bay area fans are not passionate we may be relaxed and we may have perspective as i mentioned but super passionate like it just i think that just shows it right there all right so uh before we get into the cards again tell us about your podcast the san francisco giants fan show i know i've been on it it's a lot of fun talk about uh, some of the recent trends in giants baseball tell us a little bit about it yeah, it's over on Fan Media Network. You can download the app. You can actually watch it on there or you go to our website, Fan Media Network. Uh, great stuff that's going on there where basically we are a uh, website that's for the fans, by the fans. Uh, I have been reaching out to different Giants fans and experts and, and voices from the game, former players, radio personalities. Uh, and the whole thing is it's really optimized for like if you're on the go and you're on the train or, uh, you know, wherever it is, you're on your way to work and you just want a quick update of what's going on with your favorite team. You can go on the app and just watch a 15 minute interview with some great great personalities or uh, catch up on the week of Giants baseball. So head over to Fan Media Network. That's where you can find me and uh, the San Francisco Giants fan show. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah. And, and what about Mojo Breaks Media? Tell us about that. Yeah. Uh, this has been 
a blast. Like it's kind oh, of man, a, you're it, blushing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this has been a blast to do Mojo Break, uh, to be part of Mojo Break because, uh, yeah, last year it was kind of just it kind of just fell into it where I was still at 95.7, but you know, all the craziness of last year was happening, and I was kind of looking for something different, a little something a little more consistent. And this just felt like the best of both worlds where like one, I'm closer to home and that's great. Uh, and this is a great company that already had years under its belt, a decade under their belt of being one of the best in the business. Uh, if you're not familiar, what Mojo Break does is we call them breaks, the sports card breaks. And basically you buy into a break and especially today, trading cards can be pretty expensive uh, as, as the interest in this hobby has grown and grown and grown. And the, it's some of the cards are just insane. Now uh, what they, what you're getting in each box. So the way they do it is that you get into a break and you say, well, I'm just a fan of the giant. So you buy into a break, you just buy the giants and you're getting all the giants cards, whatever they may be. Uh, and we also have somewhere if you just, want to get a random team or you want to get your own box uh and we've also expanded since i've been there to our media channel which um on top of the podcast that they've been doing for years the hype uh which we're just about to have our 200th episode this week actually so uh but on top of that we're expanding to do more interviews we actually were just at the national the uh, national sports collectors uh convention in chicago joe staley former 49er was hanging out with us Saw that. Mm-hmm. uh awesome stuff. He, joe's awesome uh longtime friend of the company so we're gonna be doing more with him um it's been a lot of fun man it's like riding this wave of sports cards uh has been wild over the last year i kind of came in thinking hey this is kind of getting big because when i was at 95 7 you know, we're just digging to find any sort of stories to talk about during you know when all sports were shut down um and it was a struggle, but like every single week, I'm like, oh, here's another story about a LeBron James card that sold for a million dollars. Oh, this Mike Trout card sold for four million dollars. Like, what's what's happening right now? And then to get vaulted into this and realize this is gigantic. This is bigger than I've ever even imagined. Uh, it's wild. Yeah, and actually, that's a perfect segue into talking cards. So, like, when did you start collecting, and what made you really fall in love with the hobby? I've been collecting basically since I started following baseball every day, probably the year after I had a neighbor who uh, we were around the same age and we would just, we would, we would go around uh, mowing lawns or doing other chores around the neighborhood and save up a little money. And then I, one of our dads would take us to the card shop uh, and we would just buy the packs of uh, 2002 tops uh, was our card of choice or yeah, I think it was all two tops. Uh, so that was the first ones I, I collected and we just collected so much of it. Like we were going every single week buying like five, six packs a week uh, during, during that summer. Uh, and then from there, it was just like, I think uh, one year my dad just said, let's just get the whole complete set. Who's screw going to the card shop. We let's just do one fell swoop. Uh, so I was collecting for a long time. And then probably the end of high school is when I stopped collecting. I would get packs every once in a while, just to kind of uh, reignite the interest. Uh, hadn't been collecting for a while and then got on with Bojo break and realized there's real money to be made here. And uh, I should probably get into cards again. Yeah, and Phil Hughes does it. Uh, Phil yeah. Hughes is a is a now master, you know, box yeah. breaker. And Phil's polls is legit. I know um, uh, Matt Stram uh, of the Padres. Mm-hmm. Uh, it has a show with Loop. Uh, I know uh, Loop also has got a, a deal with John Boy right now. Uh, it's gotten legit real fast. Like it's you know the big the big boys are starting to get into this. So that's that's how you really know this is legit right now. Yeah, I feel like it was after the last dance, you know, all the memorabilia started just blowing up, um, which is cards going through the roof. A hundred percent, which is really interesting. But I figured I'd show you some of mine here. Uh, All right. So I have I have I mean, I would collect same as you with friends and we would sell cards. We would buy cards with that money. We'd go to Target, get the blaster boxes. We'd go to lefties, get the hobby boxes, order hobby box. I mean, it was great. So. Uh, I was actually just in Burlingame and I missed an opportunity to go to lefties. So that's a, that's a shame. Bad, bad job on my part. Well, if you're but ever I, down in Santa Clara, San Jose, make sure Bojo break shop. That's where we're at. And I just had to throw that plug in. <laughs> yes. I'm down there a lot. So I should, yeah. <laughs> yes. I should do that. So I guess I'll start from, uh, I, I have a few. So I have a lot from the eighties, nineties, 2000. I think I have the complete sets from 2011 to 2017, I think. 
Nice. But I, I just took some notable ones. I got my three Derek Jeter when uh, he was in high school, you know. Uh, oh, man. Yeah. So th- those are some of the uh, I love Derek Jeter. Always have. He's any up he's there. one of those where any Jeter rookie, you've got something special. Mm-hmm. You said you, you just said, by the way, you got the 2011 complete set. Yes. So you're telling me, do you have a trout just lying around somewhere? It's lying around somewhere. I got to find it. And then the next year I have the Harper, but it's funny because one of them's a short print, but I got to find it. So oh boy, you yeah. better hope it's, I mean, if it's Harper, that's great, but boy, yes. if it's Trout. Yes, for sure. Yeah. And then this one was actually signed by Bruce Bochy at Fan Fest. Nice. So the future Hall of Famer. This was when I was young and still going to the Fan Fests. Uh, and then here we go. Here's my Anthony Rizzo out of 10, nine of 10 auto relic. Oh excellent that's one of my favorite ones as well rizzo uh is you know nickname of mine that in high school and this was out of a hanger box on my birthday one year hanger box the ten dollar boxes you know not really much but okay it's a redemption congratulations you're set to receive uh autograph scouting report autograph of mike trout so you know how it works. A few months later, it comes in the mail. There it is. Haven't oh, even taken it out my yet. Goodness. It's like 600 bucks right now on the market. Not going anywhere ever. So that is my prize position right there. When I mean, when uh, when grading companies start reopening again, that's uh, that might be right on the top of the list to go yes. get that in a nice, you know, something something like that right there. There's a little reflection today. Yes. Go. Is that the Vlad Jr.? He's going is- for a lot now. Huh? This is kind of my thing now is I, I will buy a few players before the season starts. Nothing huge, um, but guys that I think are going to have big years. Uh, that was the top of the list right before the season started. Uh, this is already, yeah, that, that's already starting to get up there, but I'm not getting rid of that for a long, long time. Uh, I'm looking at those trout comps of basically the same type of card and saying, that might be my son's college tuition right yeah. there one day. <laughs> Yeah, and I know Soto's going for a lot too. Jasper, what do you have? I know you showed there oh, he is. Soto. There's Mr. There so he that's is. just the base, but got it had to get it, had to add it to the collection. Yeah, yeah, so I didn't I didn't really realize till it was too late that cards were coming becoming big, but I like to collect weird <laughs> cards. So like I got some Aaron Boone right here. Like I like to collect managers. I got Chili Davis, Clint Hurdle, oh, Bob I love Melvin, it. Giants. Uh, and then, of course, Billy Ripken, because he just lives in his brother's shadow and continues to do it now. Now, uh, if you had that, uh, that the Billy Ripken oh, card, yes, if you know what uh, I mean, yes. now, that would be uh, something. That would be Dave great. Rigetti, Mike Kruko. Um, But the big one I have, and it's a little chipped, I have a Michael Jordan reflective hologram Ooh, one. Um, nice. I looked it up on eBay, $12. So <laughs> nothing, nothing to laugh at. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I was never the biggest uh, card guy. You know, but- the, the thing is, too, it's, it's funny, you know, going through a lot of my older cards is the f- stuff that has value is, is funny sometimes. Uh, I'll show you one where, you know, and I'm not saying this is like a, a million dollar card, but like this is from, I think, the 03 set. Uh, there's David Ortiz uh, fielding David Ortiz, which already it was like, well, that's interesting. I don't think you ever see yeah. that. And uh, a graded version of this about a hundred bucks which is wow. just a base card i didn't think anything of it never thought anything of it so uh yeah that's the, these were just kind of the finds of my collection that was worth about a million dollars it feels like yeah. about 10 years ago with the chrome 14 uh, k's in his debut yeah it, and then actually the best cards i have ended up being stuff that my dad handed down to me when i started collecting he's like well i've got this stuff somewhere so there's the brooks robinson uh right there sorry if the light's a little what is every right old guy like brooks robinson i mean he's it's, just he, he was he was really big and i feel like he's such an underrated piece of baseball history it's crazy i know it's something about brooks robinson it's something about that slick fielder and so watching him in the world series making those plays when it was such a different time where it's like the only time you saw brooks robinson was game of the week all-star game and world series mm-hmm. so i think that's part of it plus i think uh i want to say there's a story of my grandpa uh uh talk to brooks robinson for my grandpa used to work uh do sports radio actually in montana Mm -hmm. so and i think there was some event where uh he interviewed brooks robinson so there's always been a soft spot uh for him i found that also as well which i don't know what that's worth but who is that that's that's justin verlander's draft pick card 
Hmm. So I think there's something to that. And then I, I just love the look of uh, the, the 71. I think oh, that is 1971 yeah. uh, Bob Gibson right there, which is, uh, yeah, I'm trying to get a good angle. There we go. So uh, I do. Yeah, have some of the old stuff is, is pretty cool. What's that? I do have one card I got to find. Just give me a oh, second. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll give you a second for sure. And I, I said, I told you 30 minutes, Cody, but you know what? We get <laughs> hey, caught happens. up in conversation. Man. All good. Hey, here. And you know what? If you said, uh, I like Dodger Stadium, well, this was a deal I found on eBay where I'm like, you know what? Pit so I should say this if you are looking to collect baseball, um, and I don't get it, pitchers don't tend to go for as much mm -hmm. as hitters. Hitters go for a lot, pitchers don't. It's only started now, like DeGrom is finally starting to catch up, where if you look for his single cards on eBay, they're finally starting to have a lot of value. But I thought this was good enough value, and I know he's a Dodger, but I had to get at it. It was it was a value where I thought, that's if Walker Buehler wins the Cy Young one day, that's something right there. Mm -hmm. So Yeah. yeah, Not not root for the Cy Young, but <laughs> also not, not rooting for it, I guess. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Definitely one of the bright, the bright young arms in the game for sure well cody oh, this was great jasper did you find your card no nah, there's a troy to signed baseball card somewhere Ooh. in here uh i couldn't find it i do have his rookie card but i when i was younger i pinned it to my wall so there's a big gaping hole in it <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah i have that on a few of mine uh actually it's funny you know what uh, looking at all these baseball cards and stuff um, and I know we're not a, you know, this is a baseball podcast, but this might end up being my most valuable of all my cards. There you go. If you, you get, yeah. Pokemon. The Charmander is it, the, the yeah. funny enough. That one might actually be the most valuable. So if you have Pokemon lying around, uh, you may not have like a, a, I thought I had millions of dollars just sitting in my parents' garage, uh, but maybe like $200 sitting in my parents' garage. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Just a PSA you got Cause you know, we hear the baseball card with the mom throwing them out. I mean, that's like the common story we always hear, Yeah. but I mean, don't let that happen everybody. Yeah. So that, find them, get them slabbed. So they look nice and pretty. Yeah. Like Love to see it. <laughs> Cody. Thanks for the time, man. We really appreciate it. It was a lot of fun to chat. My pleasure guys. Uh, anytime you want me on, uh, I'm happy to do it. This was fun. Yeah, for sure. You Absolutely. guys can follow Cody on Twitter at Cody Pasby. That's, Cody P A S B Y. And again, you could find them on Mojo Breaks and uh, you could find his podcast on the Fan Media Network. It's the San Francisco Giants Fan Show. And for us, you could follow us on Twitter at RizzoCast and on Instagram at RizzoCast. Some, uh, some future episodes coming up. We don't usually tease, but we got some really nice ones. SFU's, uh, FSU's uh, head softball coach Lonnie Alameda coming on the show and NBC Sports Bay Area's own Jess Kleinschmidt also coming on the show. Uh, and Chris Heston at some point is coming on. He agreed, but we're going to figure out the details. I know very briefly, Cody name dropped Chris Heston when we were talking about young pitchers that the Giants have. You got to give him, you got to give him crap about making my life way too hard because he pitched a no hitter the same night the Warriors were playing game four of the finals. So KMBR was scrambling that night, man. I'm just saying it made yeah, our life yeah. tough. It was a Tuesday night. He hit like three guys, but it was such a great, I mean, it was a great no hitter. I think the last no hitter that the Giants have thrown, if I'm not mistaken. That sounds right. Um, so yeah, for sure. So it should be a lot of fun coming up. Thank you. Thank, eh, I can't talk now. See, after a long time of doing this, thank you guys for listening. Thank you guys for watching and enjoy your day.